Thank you all for being here, this beautiful, sexy audience in London. And thank you to Matches for hosting this talk and all the incredible women at this company that I've been so fortunate to work with. Now more than ever, it's really important that we create spaces where we can speak openly about sexuality and begin to break down some of the taboos, fear, shame, judgment, and trauma around this subject. Because sex is natural, sex is healthy, and sex is an incredible source of power and pleasure. I'm really excited to have both of these women here with me tonight, whom I've known their work and admired it for years. And in particular, the incredible sex positive dialogue that they foster within the work that they do. Thank you, Liz. And after this talk, I urge you to follow Kate's Twitter account at Whores of Your if you want a little bit of sex history on a daily basis, and to get Bettany's book, The Boudoir Bible. And if you want more sex education in your weekly inbox, you can go to thesexed.com or our Instagram at thesexed and sign up for our weekly newsletter. So let's get right to it. A lot of you, I'm sure, are aware that Fashion Month just ended. And a lot of the classic trends we see on the catwalk, for example, the color red or platform shoes, they actually originated with sex workers, right? As far back as Roman times. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, um, the figure of the sex worker has been, it, it's almost universally accepted as being a woman, although that's not true at all. Um, but the figure of the sex worker has been very much maligned and eroticized and people have been fascinated with her throughout history. Um, and despite the fact that she's been very much put down and put to the margins, uh, a lot of influence into modern day culture and fashion has come from sex work. So for example, in ancient Greece and in ancient Egypt, red lipstick, so that I'm wearing lid world, who's wearing red? Hurrah. Uh, it actually signified that you were willing to be paid to give someone oral sex. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's, and that's quite messy to, in, yeah. in, in reality. <laughs> yeah, they like messy. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that that was the case in ancient Egypt. Certainly in ancient Greece, sex workers are told that they had to wear the colour red on their lips to try and make, to differentiate them basically between uh, respectable women and uh, women of the night. And that has been a consistent throughout most of sex work history was this idea that we had to control what they wore so they could be easily identified. So, yeah, but that's not like a marketing thing. That was much more about, you know, we'll, we'll um, stigmatise, but we'll also stop nice girls from being associated <coughs> with that. So, yeah, red lipstick is a very, very long history of being part of the, the sex trade. And bells at one point. Bells, yes. In medieval Florence, I think it was, sex workers had to wear bells to sort of signify their presence. And uh, lepers as well had to wear bells, so it was this constant reinforcement that they are unpure, sexually unpure. Um, other things in London, for example, in the 13th century, sex workers were ordered to wear striped hoods. Uh, and that was quite consistent throughout a lot of Europe. That, they didn't specify colors, but striped hoods, and they weren't allowed to wear furs. They weren't allowed to imitate any fashion of, of a wealthy woman. Um, in other places, they had to, I think it was Milan, they had to wear a black cloak and um, other places it was a yellow cloak and citizens were encouraged if they saw a sex worker who wasn't wearing that or was wearing that to, to, to pull it off them, to shame them, to publicly shame them. So if you saw a sex worker who was wearing a fur, a fur hood, you'd be encouraged to rip that off of her because she shouldn't be wearing it. Yeah. And another important trend on the catwalk that we just take for granted in our everyday life is platform shoes. Right, and I don't know if any of you know how platform shoes actually originated. Would you like to fill us in? Yeah, um, men were actually the first ones to wear platform uh, high-heeled shoes, so thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> but it was uh, in 16th century Italy that the, the sex workers in Florence, Milan, they started wearing, they were called chopins. So they're sort of close to what you call platforms now these huge big heels and a few of them survive in museums and they really are just staggering things and they're made of wood and they're quite ornate and they wore them for a couple of reasons first of all it's because the mud on the floor was so deep that you would want something so you weren't just walking in well shit all the time uh, but, but also to make them stand up real mm -hmm. tall so you could attract people to you and that, that, that the high heel, the kind of this posture of it, it fed into mainstream and as soon as the real high class courtesans, these women who had 
but sex work is a huge spectrum of, of different people and experiences. And price ranges. And price range, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the real courtesans have wielded enormous power throughout history. So as soon as they started wearing high heels and their fashion sense, then it influences other people in the court and then it becomes mainstream. And the higher, the higher your heel, the higher your status, the more you got paid. Yes, yeah. basically. That's basically it. Yeah, it's if you can manage it. to walk in those <laughs> bad boys. <laughs> yes. What was? I'd love to know from you what your definition of, a, of fetishism is. My definition of fetishism. Well, I mean, in reality, it's an object that uh, replaces the sexual act somehow. An object of a fetishism is an object that's been charged also by a superior or by, in, in more ancient times, uh, an energy or a god that couldn't be explained. But fetishism as we know it today, is, if we define it literally, it's the replacement of, of an object of fetish uh, for a sexual desire. For me, I think that we're all fetishists to some degree or another. We all have a love for beautiful materials, and fashion actually is, uh, it, it, it puts into an accessible vocabulary, an accessible place, uh, the fine materials that every fetishist adores, whether it's beautiful silk or leather or latex or lace or beautiful, anything that's beautiful. The fetishist is like a crow, you know? And I guess we're all a little bit crows in this room because it's a matches room now. <laughs> what was the first fashion item that you fetishized? I, for me, it was edible panties. And I've never <laughs> tried them, but I think, you know, as a child in America, we had fruit roll-ups in our snack bag. <laughs> and then I saw an advert for these edible panties and they were made from also this fruit-like material. So I just thought, oh my gosh, when you're an adult, the snacks <laughs> get really pants. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it for you? So for me, I, I was working in a vintage clothing store on the East Coast in America, and I was 16. and. I rediscovered the power of the corset. Uh, having been a child that had scoliosis, and my father kept trying, but they were suggesting that I would be put into a medical corset. So every year, I would be squeezed into a medical corset, and it felt good. I felt erect and like supported. No, and my father said, "You can't wear that. You're going to have to wear heads, uh, books on your head, and that's going to correct your scoliosis." So I had a, 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 a bit of a attraction towards anything that would squeeze me. I still have that. I need to have uh, my waist uh, constricted. I do like constriction. And garments that constrict and mold the body are definitely my fetish. Yeah. What about for you? What was your first? Well, first I, I grew up fashion? in a really small town in the Lake District, so we didn't do, I don't even think they discovered <laughs> sex yet. Um, but the fashion the item yeah. oh. that you fetishized. Do you know, I think it, I went to a, a day trip to Manchester and thought that I was quite the urban city dweller because of it. And I went to Affleck's Palace and uh, I bought a pair of purple PVC jeans and I thought I was just the coolest person ever. But yeah, that was like the first time my clothing that I remember thinking, wow, they don't have that in the Lake District. Did you wear it out? I really did, and I got beaten up, but I wore it again. <laughs> and again and again and again. And again and again. And it didn't matter how much they, they threw at me because PVC just wipe off. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, it's easy to clean. Absolutely, you can't keep me down. I think the other, the other fashion item that I really fetishized as a kid was seeing the pictures of the Victorian era sex workers um, in the 19th century wearing bloomers <laughs> with the slit in the behind, which just seemed, I mean, they're quite you know, covered compared to contemporary thongs. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you can enlighten us a little bit about the history of the bloomer. Well, like proper bloomers that like you think of bloomers, bloomers, they were sort of more of a late 19th, 20th century thing. And they came in, oddly enough, with, with, with bicycles. Like, you might not think that a bike is a particularly horny thing, but it's done amazing things for, for women and for sexual liberation. They used to say, you know, that it was a big deal when bikes came out, yeah. that women would have this thing between their legs and that you might accidentally have an Do orgasm doctors while you were, were biking. <laughs> doctors were warning women that, you know, that you might, they, basically they said in extreme cases it can lead to 
prostitution. That was, that was, yeah. like, you, you laugh, but like, that's, they really were worried about that. And this kind of idea that there was a saddle and it was vibrating between, like, doctors are writing things about, like, you know, they're the getting overly stimulated on the bicycle. Um, but obviously these women just went, well, that's just a load of shit. Um, I'm going to do it anyway. Or maybe they were, I don't know. But the bloomers came out of that because there was this uh, revolution in dress where it's called the, it was called the uh, practical dress movement or the rational the dress, dress society. society. Yeah. And it was that when women realised that they wanted to ride bikes, they probably couldn't do it on corsets and huge petticoats and, and all the rest of it. So they started wearing bloomers and trousers and taking the corsets off. And it was a really revolutionary thing. Yeah. And that's where the bloomers came from. But before that, underwear was kind of, it was almost just like two trouser legs and it was crotchless. And it was sort of tied around the middle. It's a very strange get up. Yeah. But Easy access. Though. Very well, you, yes. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> if you can get through all the petticoats. <laughs> and also, you were telling me, speaking of easy access, about the nightgowns with the slit in the front. Yes, in Italy. They, I've come across in vintage and antique clothing stores. Uh, and I don't know, Nigel, if you've ever seen this, but there's a, a gown that has a slit in the front. And it was so that you could make you could have sex or make love uh, without being undressed. The idea of seeing the body, I mean, I think that we're talking about, uh, I mean, the taboo of the body in general now, the taboo of pleasure. I mean, on the bicycle, it was a danger, the bicycle, because a woman would have an orgasm, mm -hmm. and it was considered something that a proper woman didn't do. We um, also were told not to read romance novels for fear that it would okay. cause excessive blood rush. <laughs> well, they, I mean, true. Look at vibrators today in the United States of America. They still have a sticker on it that says uh, not to be used in the case of uh, calf pain. <laughs> There's a, t a sticker. It's still in America that is on vibrators. I haven't seen those on any vibrators. I have. I will show you. I have taken <laughs> pictures. <laughs> it's a little bit changed since the turn of the century. The turn of this century. It's a little bit changed. Thanks to also ladies like us. That's true. <laughs> the, other, the other big shocking thing that came about was the ankle. So at one point, obviously, we did not show the ankle. And um, you know, society women would actually drag their skirts in the mud just because they could not bear to lift their skirt up to cross the street. And it's also a sign of the economic discrepancy because these women had maids that could clean their garments, whereas sex workers crossing the street, they had maybe one dress that they laundered again and again. So of course they had to lift, mm -hmm. lift up their skirts, right, to show the yeah, ankle. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, we fetishize anything that we don't see a lot of. The reason that ankles don't turn anyone on today and you don't have ankles on page three is because it would be weird. <laughs> we see them all the time, right? But it, when the dresses are right down there and it was just this little flash of what's underneath and it's just something there, it became really heavily eroticized because you might catch a flash of it when a woman was lifting up her dresses to cross the street. Well, the reason I had this conversation about tablecloths no. Yes. And there was a, 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 a myth, a historical myth that came about that was connected to tablecloths and the fact that we would cover the table, especially in America. Uh, and it came about in the 1830s and 40s when, when Englishmen started to actually go to America and see what this new country was all about. Mm -hmm. And they encountered the Puritans. And the Puritans were people that, God forbid, you show ankle, no? And they would actually put little sockies and, and little trousers on, on piano tables and on chairs, <laughs> and they were covering the tables all the way to the bottom. And, and it, so it this got would a be little like bit totally mixed. This shocking would be sex. right here. <laughs> <laughs> this is pornographic. This is pornographic, these chairs. <laughs> so, yeah, no, but it was a bit of a, it was a little bit of a, um, a historical myth that came about because uh, of, of, of the Puritan tendency in America to be quite extreme when it came to things, even like table legs. It's a bit of a myth, but myths become part of culture. And I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to break those myths down. It's yeah. an ongoing process. Myths and, and go hand in hand with ignorance and not knowing, you know. Remarkable how little it's changed from what was fetish wear in the 1920s to what's fetish wear now. It's still stockings and corsets and kind of restrictive things. There's clearly something that we're really drawn to about I think that. It's logical. I mean, there's nothing closer to your body than a garment, no? especially mm -hmm. underpinnings. Uh, and uh, we, we want to feel beautiful and we want to feel desired. No? And the end in fashion is very connected to feeling beautiful and desired. 
with some of these garments that have been traditionally used in fashion to oppress and restrict women, like the corset, like floor length swimming garments, which basically, I mean, I don't know how there weren't more drowning deaths, you sure know, at like they Brighton. Talk about it. <laughs> Foot binding. <laughs> a lot of a lot of these same I items we've now reappropriated, right, as symbols of eroticism and empowerment, like the corset. So how does something like the corset <laughs> and being bound, because you said you really you like being constricted, how does that help you achieve a sense of freedom? Well, part of it's architecting the body. These are devices that allow us to really change the shape and and uh, architect the way that our bodies are. No, it's transformational, of course it is transformational. And I actually start to delve into the power of constriction through the corset because being tied up very tightly in my teens to work a look, I realized this is changing the way I'm breathing, this is changing the way I feel, I feel good. After about three hours I wanted to be out of it because it was a Victorian corset that maybe was not fitted like a Mr. Pearl corset and hitting in all the wrong places and I would have like marks and things from boning that was popping out and, and, <laughs> and things like that. But I did realize uh, that something changed in me and it's kind of like wearing a heel. It's really more maybe simple to, to, to talk about a heel in the way that the corset changes the way we move, a heel changes the, the way that we move a high heel, no? And uh, of course that got furthered with, with my fascination with ropes and it brought me to study a lot about what was going on in the brain in the moment that the, the, the body is constricted and something shifts you know, in the way that the body's also working. If you're, if you're, if you're wearing a very uh, a properly fitting corset, it changes the way that you breathe and it also changes the way that you move through space. And there's something empowering about it. If you own it and you want it and you like it, then it's, there's something powerful about it. And it also uh, can, can generate the release of endorphins. So it kind of gives you a bit of a high, an endorphin high. The, it, the, the Victorian corsets, they weren't very empowering. They were, they were quite damaging. Mm -hmm. was, like, they didn't the have original, a choice. Yeah, yeah, that's the I difference. I think choice right? is also is really important. The, uh, the ideal Victorian circumference of the waist that they wanted to try and restrict the waist to with the corset was between 18 and 22 inches. So we try and imagine like what has to move around inside your body to do that. And to, like you're saying, it's not, it wasn't a choice. It was kind of uh, forced on people. And if you go to, uh, there's a pathology museum in London and you can see specimen exhibits of crushed uh, rib cages yes. and sort of organ displacements and things like that. So they were, when there was a movement against these corsets, that's what they were rebelling against. So it's really interesting to me that we would come back to that and kind of find something empowering and even liberating <coughs> in that. Yeah, it's reappropriating the mm. garments our ancestors were forced to wear. Yeah. I mean, because I think the word is choice. choice no? yeah, you can choose and you can have that experience and at the end of the evening you can take it off. No? Yeah. I mean, they started to corset train children, also little boys, mm -hmm. uh, at the age of four or five. You can see pregnancy corsets. Well. Yeah, see pregnancy lots corsets. of pregnancy <laughs> corsets. It completely the changed woman. the shape of the body. It moved organs around, mm -hmm. constricted, constricted the organs, and, and, but it started very young. Mm -hmm. But all, again, also for little boys. The idea of a stay mm -hmm. was something that, that was imposed. You know? It was about posture. I mean, I love it because of the fact that it does change the way that I relation myself through a space, no? Uh, but uh, I can take it off. They couldn't. There were tennis courses, there were sports courses, there were uh, courses there, that nursing were corsets. Yeah, nursing yeah. corsets. Nursing corsets. It was yeah. considered quite indecent to not be all to kind not be of corseted. Yeah, crushed in like that. I mean, you'd be burned at the stake right now. I totally would. Absolutely. <laughs> so many reasons. Me, I'm really trapped. We'd probably all be burned at the stake. Yeah. Who knows? In America these days. Anyways, um, actresses, actresses who were are now we take for granted as style icons, right? Uh, even at the turn of the 20th century, women who are on stage and who wore makeup which was another, again, synonymous with sex work, were seen as loose and lacking morals. Mm -hmm. But like, sex, like, like sex, wor sex workers, other women and men were really fascinated, right, with what they were wearing on stage and off stage. Yeah, I mean, the, any kind of like, like sex worker, actress, anybody who kind of embodies this like, 
deviant sexual, at least we're projecting this deviant sexuality and it becomes fascinating when we're not allowed to do it ourselves, right? We kind of live vicariously through that. We're like, oh, it's awful, it's terrible. I wish I got the chance to do it, but still, it's, it's really bad they are. Um, but actresses have, have always been synonymous with, with being uh, sex workers because it was considered a very indecent profession to do. Like, why would any self-respecting good woman get on the stage and, and pretend to be these things? But it, it um, like Nell Gwynn, for example, she was mm -hmm. the mistress of Charles II and my absolute favorite. Um, but she started on the stage. She started and she caught the attention of the king and uh, it really could propel a career. All the great stars of the Follies Bergère, mm -hmm. like Liane de Pougy and La Belle of Terra were all great courtesans. Yeah. And they had gifts of like corsets made of diamonds from Cartier by their lover. So I don't know, if I was, if I was around back then, I know what I would be doing. Well, I'm yeah. not stage. <laughs> I want that corset, you just, right? I mean, you've got to, you know, like, you've got to admire these women really for playing the hand that they were dealt. I mean, it was a deeply, patriarchal world where women you couldn't really make your own fortune so like what was open to you well were our choices yeah you could inherit it or you could marry it or you, or could, you could be devoted it. to god right <laughs> you yeah. could be devoted to god and lock and be locked up in a convent absolutely so they really were playing the the cards that they were dealt you make me think of may west i see her in jail behind the bars because yep. of sex no when she did the broadway show and repeatedly i mean they would put her in jail and then she would come back out that are in jail, mm -hmm. and she has a thing that she has an exp um, something that she would say that I, I I remember very well, and I relate to it really really closely. You know, she said, "Everyone in life should have a mission. Making people happy is the height of my ambition. Mm -hmm. And when I get them happy, they stay in that condition. I have a method all my own. I really relate to that. I mean, I feel like she's like my mommy somehow." <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> um, we're running out of time, so I would like to touch on this point. That I think that even now, there seems to be so much politicizing and policing of, of wardrobe on both ends of the spectrum, whether there's criticism from pop culture for people who dress more conservatively to do their religious or cultural background. Or on the other hand, that this really outdated dictum that you can't be a feminist and be overtly sexual. So I want to know what can we do? How can what can we do about being less restrictive in our judgment of others? Oh well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Um, see, I always thought that I was a fully paid-up, card-carrying member of the feminist brigade, and then I then I met feminists and realized I wasn't the right type of feminist. That was really weird for me. I was just, but I'm one of you. How can you not like me? <laughs> I don't understand. And they'd say, no, no, you support sex workers. You think that sex is a, you know, we think it's exploitative. Blah, blah. And it just blew my mind. And I just, I, I didn't, I've never quite known what to, what to do. Is I think that if you, you need to respect people's choices and people's bodily autonomy and to do what they want, the hell they want with their own body, even if it's not what you do with your body, as long as nobody's being hurt and everybody's okay. But you can't force people into that kind of viewpoint, I think. You just, you know, remind them, I'm a feminist, and I've got tits, and I'm OK. <laughs> but I think probably everybody in this room is a feminist. Mm. I mean, it's just the belief that we have equal rights no? at the end of the day. And you don't have to dress like a man, and you don't have to, you don't have to burn your bras anymore. I believe that it's really important that also that in this moment, particularly, that men are they, they come with us, that we work together because we've, we've been pushed aside for 2,000 years. And today there is, there's a movement happening, but it, 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 it is a window to work in. It could be finished tomorrow. Look what's happening in America. What's happening with abortion laws, et cetera. It's a tiny window. So I, my message tonight would be to take advantage of this moment of, of, of freedom and possibility to dialogue and to work together and that women don't push men aside and vice versa, because that's what's happened to us for 2,000 years. So if we work together, so I bring the men with us. We have to change the paradigm. We have yes, to we uplift do. each other. And we do have to be having these conversations with each other that maybe are uncomfortable to have, or maybe you feel you know, embarrassed or ashamed. But there's no, our sexuality is constantly evolving and it's unique as our fingerprint. No two are alike. And we're all on this journey. What turns us on at 16 is different than 36, than 66, and yes, you can be having great sex up until the day they take you away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming and being with us.